This is the Agile Uprising Podcast. Hello and welcome to the latest installation of the Agile Uprising Podcast, the Agile Manifesto author review. Um, we are very lucky today. We're joined by Martin Fowler of, um, of ThoughtWorks Chief Scientist fame. So thanks for coming along, Martin. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Although I do notice you always say you're very lucky with everybody you ever have on the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you've listened before. Yep. <laughs> I've been spying on you called uh, listening to your podcasts. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, well, I meant it every single time and I mean it this time. You are very lucky. It's it okay. is an honor to have you. Um, after all, you are the man in the center of that, that very famous, very blurry picture on the, uh, the Agile Manifesto website. So, yeah, I look at my best when it's a blurry photo. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I also have a face for podcasting, so this is working out well for the two of us. <laughs> Um, so to get started, um, you're pretty much an open book since you've published nine, but you have, you've quite a a history that is available to the, um, to the masses out there. Um, one thing that's, that's kind of prevalent in our industry is there's an influx. There's more and more people coming into software development. Um, and just by the sheer number of conferences into agile every single year, um, for those that may not be super familiar, not super technical, Uh, Do you mind just giving a a quick rundown of of your history leading up to around 2001 without going all the way back to the uh, the college days? Okay. Yeah, I can do that. So in the mid-90s, I was working as a consultant and trainer, primarily focusing on teaching people about this new weird OO stuff. Um, I'd uh, had some experience in particularly the world of OO design. I'd done work with Smalltalk and with C++. And I was wandering around various projects, doing consulting, giving training courses, things of that kind. And that was pretty much what I did for most of the 90s. I was an independent consultant based in the, in, in the US, um, in Boston, where I currently live. Um, and that involved a lot of technical stuff about the design and the architecture of you know, how to use objects well, that kind of thing. But it also included some degree of project management stuff. Um, The OO community tended to be very much in favor of incremental iterative approaches, much more so than the the dominant waterfall thinking of the time. Um, And if you dig around, you'll find books like um, Adele Goldberg and Kenny Rubin succeeding with objects or Grady Booch's object solutions that, that really do talk a lot about that and capture that kind of stuff. So I was talking about that as well as about um, OO in the kind of technical context. But the thing that really got me into the Agile world was the fact that one of those clients happened to be Chrysler. um, And one of the projects I happened to get on was Chrysler Comprehensive Compensation, otherwise known as C3, which was the birth project of extreme programming. Um, And there's lots I could say about that project, but I'll just Mm -hmm. confine it for the fact that it gave me the chance to work for about a year or so with a really sharp bunch of people um, in particular, including Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries, this was, of course, the birth project of extreme programming, a project where Kent really took all his ideas from different experience that he'd been on projects at the time, brought them all together into a cohesive whole, um, and we had a really interesting project as a result of that. Uh, and I, on lots of levels, saw, oh, this is so much better than how much most of my clients do. Um, and that I'm able to persuade my clients to do. So it very much influenced my um, approach in the sort of later 90s after I'd done that project. But I, I oh, do interrupt, by the way. I mean, uh, I, I can waffle on for ages. But I didn't get so much success at getting clients to do what I'd seen um, Kent manage to persuade Chrysler to do, partly perhaps because they weren't so desperate. Hmm. Um, but I still kept trying to chugging along and I engaged with the sort of slowly growing XP community. And then I got the opportunity to work with a small software development company in Chicago. Um, and similarly to how Chrysler had been with their payroll project, they were, had a project that well, the trajectory was clearly not very good. 
Um, and But the great thing about them was that they were very much more open to the kind of ideas I was talking about. Hmm. So when I talked about extreme programming ideas to most clients, they would go, hmm, that sounds interesting, but we see some really serious problems here, so we don't think we can do it. Um, but this company's attitude was different. It was said, oh, that's interesting. We see some really serious problems here. Maybe we can figure out how to solve them. Nice. Um, and I was helped by the fact that I convinced them to get uh, a certain Mr. Ward Cunningham involved as well. Hmm. Um, and um, the team... Um, Turn the project around. Um, and I always say, you know, we didn't fix the project for them. We perhaps shone a light down the path and said, that looks like a good path to go down. But they were the ones who actually walked down the path, got out the machetes and cut the way. So which, it, in, which industry was this uh, Chicago company? Um, they, were, they, were, they were and are a software development company called Fortworks. Ah. The project was um, to do with leasing, equipment leasing. Mm. Um, and this was kind of the first blaze of sort of full-on extreme programming agile for Fortworks. And then uh, as far as your cohorts go within the, um, the manifesto signatories, uh, was you and Ward, were there any others? Because I know there's a few that are nestled into the, um, nestled into the Chicagoland area. Oh, yeah. Well, Bob Martin and, and Jim Newkirk, who isn't a signatory, but was one of the early extreme programmers, did some consulting for one of the other projects of Fortworks. Obviously, Jim Highsmith has since joined us. Hmm. Um, I, I was offered a job after in, in early 2000 at Fort Works, which was interesting because when I went independent in the early 90s, I said, great, never have to get a job, never have to work for a company again. Um, but they were my favorite client. And yeah. I'm still with Fort Works 17 years later. Oh, um, I mean, it's shocking when I think about it, but I mean, I've, I've actually had the, the chance um, to do this. Um, and that was very, you know, that kind of begins to set up to the time um, for uh, um, the Snowbird meeting. So yeah. I'd seen a a XP, extreme programming, work really well at Chrysler, even though the project went on to difficulties. Um, I was able to get Fortworks to do, to persuade Fortworks to try it out. They really sort of went forwards and advanced it another level. Um, and although the industry wasn't so keen, on what we were talking about. We knew we had something that was a very effective way to do some software. Specific to the, um, the, X3, uh, the XP practices, when you started on that C3 project, do you happen to recall, like if you can take yourself back you know, to, to that time, what, was there one of the practices or was there something that happened that really um, resonated with you as, the, as oh wow, this, this is something, this is, this is so revolutionary, this is, I wanna learn more about this? Well, there were two things. The first thing, which was, I guess was the thing that above all made me take Kent seriously was the attitude to testing. Mm. So I, this entirely independently of this in the early nineties, I remember going, I think it was the very first Oopsler I attended at Oopsler 1992. I remember going to a talk by big Dave Thomas, not Prag Dave, big Dave. Right. And in an offhand remark, he said something like all objects should be self-testing. And I thought, Ooh, that's an idea. What would, what would it be like if I could just type a line of code into my small talk image and every object in the system would test itself in the same way that memory tests? I mean, I don't know whether you're old enough to remember the PCs would always start with a little memory test thing. I just I barely, know. just barely. And um, basically, it was the same idea with uh, software. So I wonder what that would be like. So I started doing that for my personal projects and for some um, client work I was doing. And I was just knocked away by the difference it made. Because suddenly... I could have confidence that my software was working. And if I changed something, hey, that, then it worked. Hmm. So Kent said, came right from the off um, with that same notion, except done a good bit better. His framework for testing in Smalltalk was much better than the one I had. And this was the one, of course, that was the genesis of JUnit. And hmm. then all the other XUnit frameworks that followed. But then Kent took it a level further. I remember him coming, I had some example code I was showing him for something. Um, and I wanted his advice because, I mean, there was no, you know, no better source of small talk programming advice than Kent. Right. Um, you know, I thought myself fairly hot stuff, but, you know, compared to Kent, no way. Um, and he sat there in the um, hotel room with me and refactored it in a, uh, sorry, I shouldn't even say refactoring because I didn't know the word at the time, but he changed it with these tiny little steps little step change, little step change. And it was so smooth and so fast. This was refactoring. And I went, 
Ooh. <laughs> um, and I thought, this, this is special. It's such and an incredible time. Term. I mean, it's such an incredible time because um, I think it was when we, when we spoke with Bob Martin, he talked about his first pair programming exercise was in a conference room at a conf- uh, obviously at a conference with Kent, and they literally just sat shoulder to shoulder, and it blew his mind, right? And then you mm. talk with, when we spoke with Ron, it was the same thing. Like, you guys literally just cosmically found each other and started going through these practices to recodify these practices. And you laugh, but it, it's interesting to me. I mean, I'm jumping to the third stage of the interview here, but um, it's interesting to me how many teams don't do these things, even today. I mean, we're talking – 20, 25 years later, and we're, and we're still having these same conversations where we're talking about, you know, unit tests. We're talking about test oh, yeah. tests. We're talking about shifting quality left, building, building quality into the software. Well, I talk, I've talked to so many people who are sort of much more active consulting than I am these days, and they say it's still the very basics of refactoring are just not understood by enough people. Hmm. Um, and um, that's sad. I mean, to me, it was, it, that was the most mind-blowing thing and realizing the consequences of that. And of course, this is what led to the refactoring book because Kent was too busy writing another book to write the refactoring book, otherwise he would have written it. Nice. Um, and, um, but that was, I mean, there were lots of other things about C3. I mean, the continuous integration, mm-hmm. um, the planning process, uh, the whole collective ownership thing. I mean, there was, I, mean, I mean, it was extreme programming and it was a blaze. Um, of doing lots of things differently. The very short iterations. I right. mean, the four, I mean, we talked about iterative incremental development, right? right. We thought, you know, what, you know, if you're really kind of a small project and very nifty, maybe you might oh, could run with iterations of only a couple of months in length, hmm. right? And we were doing three-week iterations. And, of course, now we'd look at three-week iterations and go, oh, well, that's, that's ridiculous. You never want to go so long. Exactly. Uh, but at the time, three weeks was pretty damn fast. Right. That's great. So I, I, I'm going to pull us back out of the rabbit hole that I, that I sent us down here. And, and it's in 2001, um, there were, I guess there were, a, there was an XP conference up in uh, right. Oregon. No, I, don't, I don't want to go to 2001 yet. 2001 okay. is a bit late. And one of the things you'll discover is I have virtually no memory of Snowbirds, so it's no good. So we've got lots oh, of time I'll, to kill before then. I will, I will crack into the back corner of your brain and pry some memories out of you, don't worry. But... Um, the real origin, as I see, of the Snowbird meeting was the XP leadership meeting in the Rogue River Valley that Kent hosted in, I'm going to say, spring. Well, it was definitely spring of 2000. It was before the season really started for the place where we were going to, with those boating and the like. We were at the very beginnings of the season. Um, so I'm thinking it must have been kind of spring around. In the, and this is... This is in Oregon where Kent lives. I mean, it's, you go to the middle of nowhere in Oregon and then you head into the wilderness for another <laughs> 60 miles to get to where we live. So, I mean, it really, we are talking um, nowhere. Walk into uh, the banjos? Mm, no, no, that's, that's Appalachia. They yeah. don't do so that. And Kent's a very good um, guitarist and banjo, know, that yeah. kind of thing, player. Um, but anyway, we had this Rogue River meeting. This was the kind of the leadership of extreme programming. And one of the things to bear in mind is... Certainly from my perspective, in 2000, when people were talking about this kind of software development, extreme programming was the dominant thing. Um, part, I mean, no one was, hardly anyone was talking about Scrum or feature-driven development or certainly in the US, DSDM. Right. I mean, extreme programming was the big thing. You know, Kent's book had come out. Um, it had got a lot of press. Um, he was now launching a series of books. Um, at that time, in early 2000, we w- I was working with Kent on the Planning Extreme Programming book, which was one of the books in his series. Um, extreme programming was getting all the rage. I remember li- t- chatting with a, another leading OO guy who was saying, oh, everybody's got to be doing extreme programming these days. It's, it's a really hot thing. So this is quite an interesting little leadership um, gathering, and it was really a Kent's desire to try and bring everyone together who was really pushing XP at the time. And um, so we had a bunch of people who were the kind of leading XP people. So the Ron Jeffries, myself, um, Kent Ward, um, Don Wells, um, you know, uh, Bob Martin, Jim mm-hmm. Newkirk, all the people that were kind of involved in the XP community at the time. Right. But there were also some 
outside, as it were, guests. Um, Craig Dave Thomas, I remember, was there. Um, Jim Highsmith was there. I don't remember Alistair Coburn being there, but I wrote in an article about it that he was there, so he must have been, okay. which should which is a, a lesson there to not take my memory too seriously because I can't remember important things, clearly. Um, and one of the things I remember that was very important part of that meeting was we had this discussion about what should XP be? Should it be the relatively narrow, concrete thing that Kent described in the White Book? Or was it really a broader, more principled thing that bore these notions of... Um, that had a flavour of what XP. That was something, say, that was very appealing to somebody like Craig Dave. Mm -hmm. um, that was the kind of thing that was exciting, but not necessarily tied to the very concrete practices of refactoring and pair programming and collective code ownership and continuous integration and all the other stuff that was in the white book. Right. And Kent concluded that although the broad thing was a desirable thing, he was more interested in the concrete thing. Um, kind of a stake in the ground to mark this is something that you can kind of follow and work with and so that was where he wanted XP to go which then led this question well what was this broader thing what should this broader thing be and that was what led Uncle Bob to say okay well let's try to get together another gathering right. that was focused on the broader question so and that's what led to Snowbird Staying in that XP leadership um, conference that you had, there, I mean, I, I'm pretty comfortable in saying, confident in saying, there were no artifacts that came out of that meeting that stand to the test of time. No. There's, there's very little record of it even happening other than the right. word of mouth, right? Yep. As, the, as that session closed, was there anything that you walked away from that, like, with, um, that you took into your coaching or that you took into your software practices beyond what you went in with? I'm sure of a word, but I wouldn't be able to tell you what they are. Okay. I mean, I've been to a lot of these kinds of gatherings, right? So you, you know, I think on some of the earlier podcasts, I've mentioned the Wood um, series, Workshop yeah. on Object-Oriented Design. Yeah. That was run by a guy called John Hopkins in Snowbird, interestingly, a yeah. big coincidence. And that was, in fact, where I first met Kent, was at one of these Wood workshops. Um, in the, um, it would have been the mid-90s, just after I moved to the U.S., um, and that's where I first met Kent, where I first met Ron. Um, that's not, sorry, not Ron Ward. Um, and a bunch of other people who, who didn't come to Snowbird. Um, and, I mean, they were chances for people to get together, exchange ideas. Um, I mean, I, and I have this memory of John talking, John Hopkins talking about something to do with the incremental process and Kent really kind of grabbing hold of that and him saying later on that that informed his vision of extreme program. I can't tell you what it is, <laughs> right? But the point was that ideas were cross-fertilizing people all the time. Yeah. I created a, with Bruce Eckel a similar workshop at around that same time. Um, that Bruce Heckel was hosted in Crested Butte that was about trying to talk about tough software architecture. Mm. That ran for quite a few years. An offshoot then developed in Europe called Software Arch Architecture Workshop. And it was at one of those workshops a few years ago, they said, we really must get together some common thinking about how we approach service-oriented architecture. And they came up with the name microservices to describe it. Mm. Right? So these kinds of sessions are around and they're out there and they're very fulfilling but they don't tend to have concrete outputs right. because what's important is the conversation, but also the relationship building. If I hadn't have gone to Wood, I would have not have been able to continue taking part on the C3 project with Kent, and I would never have got the exposure to extreme programming. That was a personal relationship formed at a workshop wow. that led to me being involved in you know, something that ended up being very important to me. Right. So transitioning to that then, as, as 2001 came and you guys were um, starting to get the conversation rolling about the, uh, the, 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 what became the Snowbird event, was right. it, first of all, as that was materializing in front of you, did you get any sense that this was going to be different than the others or did you feel like this was just going to be yet another one of those um, workshops where you guys get together and you, and you start um, sharing ideas and you start cross-pollinating those ideas? No, no. I thought it would be... Cross -pollin I was looking at this workshop to be, this is a chance to hang out with some people, some of which I know well, like Kentall Ward um, or Alistair, people like, some people I don't know very well or at all, mm. and a chance for us to exchange ideas. In, I very much saw it as a successor to the Wood workshop. 
I also want to throw in something else, a little bit um, perhaps um, self angrized ag ag self whatever. Um, but it is important to my thinking at the time. I also came out of that um, Oregon workshop thinking, I want to explore this commonality. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up work doing it the way that I do these things, which is if I don't really understand something, I write an article explaining it, right? Because <laughs> then I have to understand the damn thing. Like, this is an essay, right? It's uh, perhaps an urban legend, but it, it's a French word saying to try. I, say, <laughs> I don't know whether it's true, but it's certainly how I approach things, right? I don't understand this, therefore I need to write about it, and that will force me to figure it out. That's and that's so I wrote an, art, an, an article called The New Methodology that came out in the summer of that year. Hmm. And that was my attempt to say, well, what's similar to extreme programming and Scrum and what Alistair and Jim are doing right. and some other stuff that's floating around. Uh, that's where I first came across, I really sat down and gathered what information I could get about DSDM because there wasn't very much that was publicly available. Right. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that I, and I still think this is a very good conclusion, that were two main things that were interesting. There was the kind of mainstream what software engineering ought to be crowd. And there was this other crowd that was doing this new methodology stuff. And right. there was two big differences. The first was that the mainstream crowd was saying, figure everything out in advance. Copy your ideas from traditional engineering, come up with a plans and then execute on the plans. Plan it, work, uh, what is it? Uh, plan your work, then work your plan. That's the way to do things. While this other crowd was saying something radically different, saying, no, you don't do that. You do a little bit, look where you are, you change things, you're constantly changing your plan as you learn more information. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's the, the uh, Kent's subtitle to the white book, Embrace Change. Or as Mary Poppendick put it, and I loved her phrase, a late change in requirements is a competitive advantage. And that, to me, really sums it up. That was the first shift. And then the second shift is saying, again, the traditional notion was you have a process. You get a good process, and then you get the right kind of people, and you slot them into the process, you turn the handle, and you'll get great software. Mm. But the process is what matters. This is, um, have, you, have you come across Frederick Taylor? You must have heard about Frederick yeah, Taylor, right? So yeah, this right. is the Taylorist view, right? In the past, the man was first. In the future, the process must be first, right? Mm. And again, this new world rejects that and says, no, the process is second order. Um, and again, Al Alistair to me summed that really up when he said, you know, things like tools, processes, they're second order. What really matters is have you got good people who work together at a human level? That was to me the essence of the difference. So as we came into the Snowbird Workshop of 2001, I'd got that vision in my mind and I communicated it because I published the article and at least some people I think have read it. So your, your article, The New Methodology, right? That, that was your earliest attempt to try to codify what became the, the values, I assume? Yeah, that yeah. was my attempt to get it. And that's why you, when you say there was no outcome of um, the, mm. uh, the rogue river gathering, the, the, XP, the XP leadership gathering, while that was true in the sense of comparison to the manifesto, everybody went away and grabbed things from it. And one of the key things from it for me was writing that new methodology. Right. I, I don't remember exactly the timing. Maybe I'd already started it beforehand or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, my CVS commits in those days aren't as fine grained as I'd like them to be. Um, I look back and I just find one huge commit in the first draft of the article. So, you know, I don't know when I started it, but, um, well, the poetic beauty of, of, of Oregon begetting the article and then that being a gateway, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll leave that alone. We'll just, we'll just assume that's how it happened. Yeah, as my old history teacher said, um, if it isn't true, it ought to have been true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so as you guys, uh, as you come into Snowbird um, for the first evening, you, you had mentioned that you knew, you, you've done some of the best name dropping I've ever heard of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in my existence but so you knew a good number of the the folks that were going um as you were approaching or as you got into the into the lounge the first night and you started meeting everybody was there somebody that you had not yet made formal acquaintance with and somebody that you was you were very much looking forward to meeting for the first time um um i hadn't run into john kern or ari van Benicum at all hmm. i had heard of ken schwaber 
but I'd never met him. Everybody else I'd, I'd already met. Pro- yeah. Primarily because most of these people went to Uppsala. Right. And so I'd met them at Uppsala at various points in the past. I mean, the OO crowd is very, very central to this. And not just the OO crowd, the small talk crowd. I mean, how many of them had um, been in small talk background? The exception there was Jim Highsmith. But he I'd met not just at the um, Oregon workshop, but and I, was, I was desperately trying to think of the timing of this. He and I were both on a speaking tour um, organized by a company in New Zealand and Australia. And that's where I first met Jim Highsmith. And it was the two of us plus Steve McConnell. Um, and it was, it, was, it was great fun because I, I remember being on this panel with Steve being the relatively mainstream guy mm-hmm. and Jim Highsmith, who kind of looked like he would be a kind of mainstream old school methodologist, being so wild that even I had looked centrist in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> but he was great. And so, I'd, so that, but pretty much everybody else I'd met through Oopsla and perhaps a little bit through the patents community as well, because the software patents crowd were, of course, important. And I think that's where I'd come across Mike Beadle first, for instance. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I think in my mind, I, I picture this, this vision of you walking up to Ari and trying to get as much information from him about DSDM as humanly possible. Because at the time he was running the DSDM consortium or he was heavily engaged in that leadership community. Um, am I even close to right with that? No idea. I have no, I mean, I'm sure that such a uh, drinks and things occurred the night before. Mm. And I seem to remember Wood did that. In fact, I have more clear memory of, of doing it at Wood. I have no idea whether it happened at Snowbird. My memory of Snowbird is really very uh, limited, I'm afraid. All right. Well, knowing that I've read enough bios of you, I feel safe that I can ask you this one. What was the beer that you would have gone for at least that first night in Snowbird when you (laughs) fell it up? We're talking right, yeah. Utah, right? I mean, yeah. and also this was a long time ago. Yeah, this is back in the days when I think it had 3.5% beers in Utah. Yeah, it might have been. I, I mean, I think we had to do, I think you had to have a special membership. They, 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 I mean, just because you booked into the hotel, you were a member. But I right. seem to remember there's this whole, you have to be a member of the club in order to get alcohol business going on. Right. Um, I, I don't recall. Oh. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, beer is uh, obviously an important part of my life, but I... I have no record of it, I'm afraid. All right. I was hoping that that was going to be the one memory that you had. Nope. Sorry. All right. So then um, I'm sure that the three days kind of blend together into just one mass of time. So I'm not going to try to step through days one, two, or three. But um, I think I, it was it two days, though. Was it two, it was two days. I'm sorry. I'm blending. The, I'm rubbing the first night in there, too. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I thought it was three days. And I actually went and looked back at some old emails and realized it was only two days. I'm thinking, Jesus, we did a lot in two days. <laughs> <laughs> well, from what I understand, most of it happened right at the end, too. Like, there's a, <laughs> a good bit of spinning the wheels. Did you happen to get a look at the, um, the, uh, the notes that both John Kern and um, Andy Hunt made available to us? No, I was going to, and there's some kind of registration wall the first time I went to look at it. And I, I thought, oh, I'll come back someday when I'm ready to deal with a registration wall. And I never uh, I'll get you a better link. There, there shouldn't be a registration wall, but I'll, I'll make sure you get the raw files. Um, it, it is interesting. And I think um, the, one, the one that John gave, gave us was more of, I think Alistair said he had pre-written this, and it was his attempt at trying to get some semblance of an agenda. Otherwise, you'd have 17 alphas just sitting there trying right. to you know, do their thing. And um, what made John's notes so important and impactful to me is just how everything was LWP, right? Lightweight process or LWM, lightweight right. technology. Because it was originally, it was the lightweight methodology conference, I believe. It's the, uh, the marquee right. billing that was on the, uh, the door. Um, and what was interesting was John, all of John's notes were talking about these different practices and these uh, frameworks and methodologies that today are mostly common language, but you could just tell that he was, they were resonating with him so deeply because they were new, right? This scrum right. idea, this idea of increment, right? Um, well, it wasn't that new because he was doing feature-driven development and they were doing a lot of similar things. Right. But you could see he was circling things on the yeah. writing. For me, my, my markup, if I write anything in the margin, that's super important. <laughs> that's just okay. the, way, the way I look at things. And I assume everyone's brains are wired the same as mine. Um, but what, as you were in there and you were listening, was there, a mo- was there something that somebody was talking about? Or was there a moment where it really just kind of sparked up and you're like, oh, this is different. This is, this is not arguing all over, but you're shaking your head. So I- No. I mean, I, I remember a general sense of, of collegiality that was very pleasant. Right. I mean, I'd hung out sometime with 
at, at times with various software methodologists mm. uh, from the OO methodologies of the time. And definitely there is the battle of the egos. Um, but at Snowbird, I remember it being not that much at all, even though certainly there are people with strong egos around. Um, but there was a good, and it was interesting, 10 years later, we had a reunion at the Agile conference, and most of us uh, made it for that. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how quick we've just fell into that same collegiality after all those years. Um, it was remarkable. And I remember was it with Andy, I was saying, you know, I didn't expect it. I had low expectations of the reunion, right. and yet it was just really, really nice. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's some, I mean, it's interesting. I, I've been around a lot of software, you know, debates and all discussions over the years. Um, and I've gotten soft because we have this very nice, um, respectful collegiality in ThoughtWorks that is not true of most of the industry. Right. Um, but it was true of, of this group. That is one thing that, that, you know, from an outsider's perspective, talking to a good number of you now, we're, we're coming into the, uh, the home stretch here. There's this, I don't know if fraternity is the right word, but there's this brotherhood between you guys where nobody really wants to take credit for anything. It was more of a, a product of the, the collective than any one person. Like if we say, oh, who came up with the name Agile or who came up with this value statement versus this value statement? I, I don't even ask those questions because I usually get the laser eyes shooting right at me. Like nobody, it, it was all of us. It was, it was a social effort, right? Um, but I, it, even today, it seems like that it's super strong. Like every now and then you may see a little flare up here or there in the social world, but the, the truth is you guys are very respectful to each other and to the product that you, you created in, the, in that, that session. Um, I'm curious, um, the values themselves, and, and that's Andy's, Andy Hunt's handwritten notes were the, the thing that was most compelling to me was um, he had written the four value statements uh, the this over that, that double positive um, framework. And I guess what was originally written on the whiteboard, he had one, two, three, four, and then he scribbled it out. It went like one, three, two, four, and then one, four, three, two or something. I, I just find it interesting that uh, there was a, a discussion around the order. I, I do have a vague memory of discussing the order. And I have a distinct sense and memory, but remember my memory is very faulty, right? Now roll with this I do have a distinct, your brain. <laughs> I do have a distinct memory that we unanimously felt the number one value was the number one value. After that, the order didn't matter, but the first one had to be the first one. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Which, you, when you think about it, this is a bunch of process and tool weenies in the room together. That's quite a statement. But again, and, and the one thing about the, the manifesto I think that gets misconstrued quite often is it's not that the things on the right are unimportant. We're just mm -hmm. saying the things on the, the left are more important. They're both important. And I think quite often people, you know, they read over as instead of. And, and it, it, it's one of those things that as you go through and you start having these conversations, you, you try to drill in the importance of the, the word over and what that actually means yes. in the context of that sentence. So another vague memory is coming back to me. But at one point, the working software over comprehensive documentation, there was something else with documentation. I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to almost say pointless documentation, right? Or something like that, something clearly bad. Hmm. And it really came through that the whole thing was both sides had to be good things. Um, I, I wrote about this as, as, a, as a blicky post on my site called Comparative Values, where I talk about yeah. this principle. And the whole thing was you should be able to quite sensibly reverse all of the four values and get a reasonably co and get a coherent worldview. And that was the worldview of the mainstream engineering oriented practices, which would say, yes, it's more important to have comprehensive software, uh, sorry, comprehensive documentation than it is to have working software. Because if you've got comprehensive documentation, you can easily rebuild the working software, mm -hmm. right? If, and that may sound weird to many people, but it was a world, it was a natural view. I remember it being told that by some manager who said, what matters is the documentation. If I've got that, I can go out to any bunch of programmers and get the software built. Yeah, I know. And that was a part of the view of the world. I know when we spoke, I think it was when we spoke with Ron, uh, my, my co-host asked the question about why there were no women in the, um, in the manifesto signing and, or diversity, I think is the way the question was asked. Right. We brought up Mary Poppendick earlier and, you know, 
it, it, reading her work, reading her and Tom's work, they talk about value. Uh, I mean, it, it's lean. So yes, we're going to talk about value. We're going to talk about concept of cash all over the place. But how anybody could put value in anything that isn't working software is, is just so foreign. And it's just... It's well, so yeah, you say that, but you're... I mean, there's a whole load of assumptions baked into that statement. I mean, if you look at it from the, the mainstream of the 90s, software engineering mindset. Remember, they're very influenced by how traditional engineering works. And I have an insight about this because my wife is a structural engineer. And in traditional engineering, you have a bunch of the engineers, they come up with the plans, which are both the structural plans that say how the bridge holds together, but also the plans about how it's built. Um, those plans are valuable things in themselves before anybody sort of starts laying a first brick, right? And they are built independently of the actual construction work. Mm. And, and there was also a notion that, you know, writing programs is easy, right? You can just grab any kids out of college, and that's how a lot of software companies did operate and still do operate. Mm. We'll just bring in a whole bunch of kids. I remember being told about um, at one of my clients, I said, oh, yeah, all these bright-eyed military haircuts, um, everybody kind of under 23, 100 of them kind of roar in, and, you know, a couple of years later, out pops software. <laughs> and when the view was you could hire, you know, you know, reasonably literate kids like that with the right kind of haircut, and you could churn its stuff out. As long as you had the documentation, you could do that. That's the, that mindset. What it, I mean, it's totally different to our mindset within the agile world, but it is a, you know, it's, a, it's an intellectually cohesive way of looking at the world. It's just very different to ours. I'm just smiling because I, I recently was, was looking at a, um, a PowerPoint, a slide deck, and um, it leaned a little bit more towards the comprehensive documentation than I think uh, you or I would be comfortable with. But what makes it so ironically hilarious to me is how many times you're quoted in those slides. <laughs> 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 I'm curious now, like I, we're shifting out of sober completely at this point, but do you run into that often? Somebody that's as prolific as you, where your words are being taken out of context and used to make a counterpoint to what you actually intended? Uh, that was really brought home to me in a uh, consulting engagement I had. Um, I went into this team and they said, they were really excited to have me because they were using some of the stuff from my analysis patterns book. And they described what they were doing. And I realized they'd made some really fairly fundamental misinterpretations of what I was saying in the book. And I tried to explain it to them. And we were in this situation where we were arguing about who had the best understanding, the interpretation of what I'd written. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, that really brought home to me that thing about the limitations of writing stuff down compared to that interactive involvement and why face-to-face -face conversation carries so much more. I mean, I put enormous amount of effort into my writing. And yet I know that it's going to be misinterpreted by more people than will get the full, get the actual meaning that I'm trying to convey. Mm. And I put huge amounts of effort, way more effort into my writing than, you know, a, a team can do if they're working on a software project and, you know, writing down requirements or something. And even so, I struggle to get interpreted correctly. Yeah, and I think, I mean, for anyone that's not familiar with Martin Fowler, first of all, I'd make yourself familiar with Martin Fowler. But you, your writing is, is everywhere. Between, besides, it is nine published works, right? Uh, 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 of actual books, I think it's only seven. Is it seven? But yeah, your, your website, um, martinfowler.com, your Blicky you mentioned, just the amount of content that you make freely available is, is incredible. And then, God forbid anyone does a YouTube search, they have hours and hours of Martin viewing <laughs> pleasure. Yep. Um, so I think that is a testament to your, your character giving back to the community. You're not trying to just put out books and then, you know, get publishing rights and royalties. You're, you're doing everything you can to help build the next generation and give the knowledge to the, to the folks that have their hands in the code and their hands on the products. Um, Absolutely. You, and not just me. I mean, remember that, um, I mean, there was a lot of people saying that Kent should be copywriting, uh, trademarking extreme programming and building an industry around extreme programming. And he didn't. Right. right? I mean, it, 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 I mean, when you compare what he did with, you know, what SAFE is doing, for instance, uh, it's night and day. And then Ward Cunningham, who invents the wiki, 
mm. right? Yeah. Which is now the, the the principle on which Wikipedia is based. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's never, you know, as far as I know, got a cent from inventing the wiki. He gave it away. He gave the ideas away. Um, I mean, the contribution Ward has made to human culture is hugely more than anything that the rest of us, you know, at Snowbird did. Um, and he just gave that away, just as Tim Berners-Lee gave the web away. I mean, a lot of stuff has been built in that kind of way. Now, I you know, we also, you know, have day jobs. I get a nice little salary from Fort Works. My books bring in a nice amount of money. I have, you know, comfortable middle-class life. Hmm. Um, but, you know, we try to provide a lot of stuff and, and be valuable with what we provide and, and make it, in, uh, you know, not try to turn it into a, a much more mercenary exercise. Well, um, I think the staying power, I mean, your refactoring book, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I work for a very large, uh, a pretty large international company and um, my office is on a, um, a almost a full city block, but my floor is about the size of a full city block in downtown Philadelphia. And your books, especially the refactoring book, are just littered, like all over. They still today sit on the desks of developers that range from two years out of school all the way through people looking uh, looking at the retirement right now. So I think... Yeah, I frequently see my books propping up people's monitors. <laughs> yeah, and uh, in, in slide decks uh, talking about uh, <laughs> heavy, heavy, heavy architecture. Um, <laughs> so as you, uh, so you brought up safe. I don't have to. I, I'm curious. What's, um, <laughs> you notice how it was, that was very graceful all the way I transitioned into that. From what I, from a very good friend of mine tells me it stands for shitty agile for enterprises. I've heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I, I, by I, me because he's afraid to say it in public and so I say it for him. Yeah, so can I ask your opinion of it? <laughs> um, my, I have to be careful. My opinion is secondhand. I have not tried to delve into the safe stuff. What mm -hmm. little I've seen of it has not impressed me. Um, but I know quite a few people whose judgment I trust very deeply who have delved into it mm -hmm. and they come back with universally thumbs down. Okay. So that has made me not really interested to delve any further. Yeah, and I won't, I won't ask any uncomfortable questions since it's not something that you've done a deep amount of research on. But I guess in general, the, the various frameworks that do exist. So um, right. you, have, um, you have your article on Scrum on Martin Fowler, and I can't remember the, the, the name of the article is escaping me right now. Uh, Flaccid Scrum. Flaccid Scrum, yes. Yeah, and um, in there you dive into, to a degree, about um, focusing so hard on the, the process that we're – ignoring the technical practices, the technical best practices that should, in my opinion, be in front of the process. Um, right. I, Scrum, Kanban, um, Scrumbon, uh, any, any of the frameworks that, that exist that are in heavy use. Um, what is your opinion of the shift of the agile business model to be more embraced braced around um, frameworks than it is around methodology or around uh, mindset? Well, it's part of the consequence of Agile becoming popular, right? I mean, it's a, a lot of people you know, for a long time actually have been deeply ticked off with what's, you know, the, where Agile has gone. But the alternative is it becomes obscure. It's totally ob obscure. I mean, I, I look at it like this. In the early 2000s, when we at Fort Works wanted to run projects you know, we were being told we cannot do the kinds of things we want to do with Agile. You know, you're not going to spend that time testing. You're not going to do continuous integration. You're not going to do short-term planning horizons. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to be replanning the project every couple of weeks. Uh, that's not how software is done. And when we did it, we had to do it under the radar. We did it because they were desperate, because they'd failed twice to build the software system, and we were coming in to do it. I remember after one of, our, one of those projects where we'd done that, you know, the project had, was a two-year project. They called us in, uh, 18 months gone, no software to show for it, and we deliver kind of thing. And they say, yeah, well, you did a fantastic job. We'd like you to do some more work, but can you work the way we would like you to work this time, please? Sure. Uh, sure. You know, that was the world of the early 2000s, you know, where we tried to do this kind of work, we would be shot down for it. Now, people are saying, oh, tell us how you do things. We want you to come in and teach us your approaches. I mean, half the time they're not listening, but at least there's a desire. And there is also the sense of, well, if you really want things done and you really want ThoughtWorks to come in and get things done because we're very good at doing that, 
maybe you should let ThoughtWorks do it the way they want to do it because they're very good at this kind of thing and they do this agile stuff and it's actually supposed to be good. We've made the, the, the world is now safe for people to work in an agile way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean agile is the right solution for every problem. I, I've never felt that that was the case. Right. Um, but I do think there are a large class of problems that agile is very suitable for. And I want people to be safe to be able to work that way. Um, now, the problem is, of course, now we have the problem of cargo cult agile all over the place, and you've got to combat that. And you've got to walk up to somebody who's been on a certified Scrum Master course and, and says, oh, I've got my CSM, so I'm more qualified than a Starbucks barista to tell you how to run your projects. Um, and, you know, you, you put that against one of our project managers who's been working for, you know, with us for 10 years on agile projects. And, mm -hmm. I find it very frustrating. Yeah, well, I think there's been a, a heavy, a heavy degree of bleed over between the difference of uh, Scrum and Agile. I think so. It, it to nobody's detriment. I mean, to nobody's fault. I think uh, Scrum has become such a, pre a prevalent framework that everyone mm -hmm. assumes that Scrum is Agile and that Agile is Scrum. Yeah. That, that they are u ubiquitous, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm, you know, I, I, I would say I and, and ThoughtWorks generally much more leans towards extreme programming. If I mean, it's pointless saying what approach do you use, mm -hmm. but I would say if we're more influenced by anything else, it's XP. Um, yeah. You know, the centrality of the technical practices of saying that if you've not got good technological work, if you're not doing... Um, um, good architecture. My colleague, uh, Rachel Laycock, likes to put it, you know, you can't be agile if you're knee deep in mud. Hmm. So you've got to get the ground firm so that you can actually do the things to carry through. And I think this is also very nicely explained by the Diana Lawson's and Jim Shaw's agile fluency model. Right. Where they say, yeah, if you just take on the management stuff, I mean, there are good things. I mean, you can get some visibility, you can get some transparency as to what's going on. It's good. But to get the real benefits, you have to you have to dive into the technical stuff and it takes investment. You know, we're taking months, if not years to learn to be fluent in that level, but you get, then you get the real productivity benefits and the gains from there. And it's also the foundation to moving to the really cool stuff, which is this whole um, uh, lean uh, enterprise thinking of um, having the team really modify their own behaviors and take, so uh, having the team monitor its own outcomes and right. using those to drive things and, and that kind of stuff can be done but but you need to have that uh, technical basis because if you're in the mud you're not going to go anywhere so that probably leads into my final question i mean one thing that the, the biggest question i have for you guys as we have these interviews is what is your if you were to talk to you know say you have an, a, a nephew or a niece that's getting into software development or into um, project management or whatever discipline it is in the in, the sense of what we do, um, what advice would you have for them or what would you wish for them to, uh, to focus on deeply to make sure that we're doing things in a responsible manner? Ugh. Well, there's so much to, it's almost kind of where to start, but I think one of the most important things is to find a place that's doing a reasonably good job and immerse yourself in that place and learn from it. Hmm. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, there's many things that keep me attached to ThoughtWorks, but that's one of the things I think we best provide. Um, not just to our clients, but also to the people who come and join us. And you know, they may not stay as long as I have, but if in the course of a few years, they get to see how projects can, how, and I don't even want to say projects because of course we're not in favor of software projects. Mm -hmm. um, but if they can see how software can be done better, and see how that mindset can work in a team that's working in that kind of way, that can make a big difference. I mean, that was what did it for me back at C3, right? I could see, you know, there were many things that, you know, we didn't do so well, certainly compared to, to modern day thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it was a glimpse of, oh, this can make, this can be a hell of a lot better than, than where it would be. And I think immersing yourself in that can be a really nice thing. So, I mean, that's probably where I would, would point somewhat to, something right. along those lines. Well, Martin, this has been a, a highlight of uh, 20, 2017 for me, so I appreciate that. If, uh, if anyone was looking to get a hold of you, uh, martinfowler.com, uh, is, that, yep. is that the best way? Should they, uh, we plug oh, your yep. Twitter? What about your Twitter? You're uh, at Martin Fowler? Yep, Martin Fowler on Twitter, martinfowler.com on the web. I produce stuff at a rate which is much slower than I would like, but 
I'm working my best here at cranking it out. And, and something I'd like to say, I really like the way that you're going back to the, the roots by going back to the Manifesto authors with this podcast series. And, I, and I've been enjoying listening to them. I've listened to, I think, all the interviews. But one thing I'd like you to do soon um, is also reach out to the people who weren't at Snowbird but were still active at the time. Because hmm. um, there's some really interesting people who weren't there. Um, I mean, Big Dave Thomas, I mentioned. He, I mean, he was going to host it down in Anguilla. Right. 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 Um, he has a huge experience of, of software development. Um, he was one of the keynote speakers at the very first XP conference in Sardinia. Um, he's got a lot of good things to say. Um, Laurie Williams, who did a lot of the early um, academic work on right. um, agile methods and pair programming. Um, it would have, um, would have been great to have had, you know, she, she been there. Um, of course, one of the great sadnesses of the yeah. Of the Agile Manifesto is that it's 17 middle class white guys that signed <laughs> it, or wrote it, and not exactly a diverse crowd. Right. Um, Mary Poppendick wasn't really known to us at the time. I mean, I only met her towards the end of 1999. She hadn't really produced much, mm -hmm. but within a year, she was playing a major role in the newly formed Agile Alliance. I mean, actually, one of the proudest things for me of the Agile Manifesto authors was the way we let everything go. Um, at Uppsala, immediately after the Snowbird thing, so this would have been September, when Snowbird was February, so about six months later, um, one of the things asked is, should we create some kind of consortium that we, the authors of the manifesto, would control? Hmm. We said, no. We've created this manifesto. We hope it's useful. We've launched the ship, but where the ship goes and who crews it and who directs it, that's not up to, we are, we, we'll take part, but we don't have any special role. Mm. And it was people like Mary who then came forward and said, hey, I want to sort of push this stuff forwards. Um, and, um, of course, she brought the whole lean thing into play. Right. Um, I think of my colleague, Pramod Sadalji, who, you know, when we were at Fortworks doing that XP project, one of the big things was, how do you deal with a database? How can you possibly, you know, and I can see you might be able to evolve code, but how do you evolve a database scheme and how do you deal with the data that's in right. the database? You've right. got to plan that stuff up front. And Promote's reaction was, oh, that sounds like a hard problem. Let's try and solve it. And he did. You know, and he's not so well known, but you know, what he did with database migrations and the idea of automatically applying database migrations against the schema and against the data, that's become a core part of our practice. We wouldn't be able to deliver the software we do without it. So I've got a long list of people that, that you should interview. And it would be good to listen to those people who weren't at Snowbird, but were every bit as much as part of sort of creating the early days of Agile and making it work. So this project that I, in the back of my head, we're, we're close to wrapping up, just got longer. I appreciate it. I've got at least 17 more names to give you. <laughs> people you should interview. <laughs> All right. I think it'll be full gray by the time I'm done. Good to know. All but right. seriously, I mean, it was just a random collection of the people who happened to be asked and who happened to be free at the time. Um, it worked out very well. Um, and the manifesto, I'm very proud that I was one of the 17 that wrote it. But... I mean, the, the, like you could easily have come up with another 17 people that would have... You know, no, I think, I, I think you are onto something, and I think it is something that genuinely I, I, I will take up as the next uh, one, one of the next tracks that we go down here. So It's funny, some of the names you mentioned, we already have uh, earmarked for some projects, so hopefully uh, we get the response rate that we got from you guys. Um, well, I think that's going to bring us to a close. I appreciate yeah. all of your time. Again, this was, this was amazing. Um, I was, I'm very excited to have this <laughs> uh, when I started it. Very lucky to have this, uh, this time with you, sir. Um, and I appreciate it. Okay. Well, it's good, good, good to be on here. <laughs>